اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد ابن عبد الله وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين الحمد لله على نعمه الاسلام وكفى بها نعمه الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة اللهم إني أعوذ بك أن أضل أو ضل أو أزل أو زل أو أضرم أو أضرم أو أجهل أو يجهل علي I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I should go astray or be led astray or that I should be oppressed or that I oppress or that I should be ignorant, or that I'm ignorant, or ignorance is done to me, or that I should trip, or that I should be tripped. Inshallah, the title of this talk was Secularism, uh, The Greatest Danger uh, Facing Islam. And wh what I'd like to do is, inshallah, look at the idea of secularism uh, historically and the results of the, the secular idea upon the psyche of, of humankind, what the implications of that mean for us as Muslims particularly, but also the implications of it uh, globally for, for uh, humankind, because we are Bani Adam, we're all part of the, uh, the, the offspring of Adam alayhi salam, and so we share uh, common destinies in this world, and insha'Allah, uh, we will not share common destinies in the next world with those who reject the Adamic way, the Ibrahimic way, and the Muhammadan way Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa salatu wa salam ala al-anbiya ajma'een The idea of secularism is uh, a really a rather modern idea. In fact, it means in Latin one of the meanings of it is modern or of the age or of the time and it has the idea of temporality or an in-time situation. Uh, the word in, in, in Latin, seculum, uh, you'll find on the dollar bill, which uh, in the back of it, there's a, a Freemasonic seal, and most of the founding fathers, and this is historical, uh, it's not conspiratorial theories, or it's, it, it's accepted history in the United States, that most of the founding fathers were Freemasons, but the actual seal did not come until 1935, when it was placed on the dollar bill during the Roosevelt administration. And on the back of the dollar bill it says uh, Novus Ordo Seculorum, which means a new secular order, or a, and really what the word secular is, is a nice way of saying uh, worldly, or of the world, quite literally, a new order of the world. And this was to be in contradistinction with the old way, which is uh, orders that were based on religious structures, in other words, understandings that uh, peoples had that were based on religious hierarchical structures, on the belief that uh, not only were we created, but there was a creator and that there was a certain uh, standard of behavior that was demanded of individuals that made up a society based on certain religion and moral injunctions that came down to them. So the Christian tradition, despite the gross breaches of Christianity, nonetheless had a moral order that is not really that different from the moral order of the Muslims. And this is why we share with other religions certain basic moral concepts and precepts. The, the, where we begin to depart grossly is how we deal with breaches of the moral order. And this is what we call in Islam the uh, hudud in sharia. In other words, the, when there are gross breaches of the moral order, how do Muslims uh, deal with that? We deal with it by going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger and looking at what the Sharia dictates for us, this sacred law, this sacred way. Uh, cr the Christians traditionally, because they separated uh, their teaching from the Judaic tradition which did have a sacred law, and this can be found in remnants of it in Deuteronomies and Numbers and Leviticus and, and the books of the Old Testament where there are injunctions of how to deal with thieves, of how to deal with fornicators, adulterers, all of these things. The Christians departed from this based on a, a, a verse that's in the New Testament uh, from Paul in Romans 7 where he uses an analogy of a woman married to a man and she's bounded by the law as long as she's married to the man and when the husband dies she's no longer bound by the law in other words of, of, of being a married woman she can go and marry other uh, men 
Well, in uh, what Paul uses this as an analogy for the death of Jesus Christ. In other words, that when Jesus was alive, we were still bound to the law, meaning the Judaic law. But since Jesus has died, we are no longer bound to the law. Jesus has freed us through his death from the law. And this is a very important concept in Christianity. And this is really setting up the scenario of the uh, using the rational intellect to deal with law. In other words, Paul's belief, and whether he was sincere in it or not, uh, Allahu alam, but Paul's belief within his, his, his uh, based on what he said, is that people, because they were in such a deeply spiritual state imbued with the Spirit of Christ, they would not go into the errors that necessitated the law in the first place. So it was almost like, if we're looking at it as Paul being a sincere person in what he was preaching, that, he, that his spiritual state was so high based on being imbued with the Holy Spirit and with the Spirit, that he could not fornicate, that he would not, that, 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 because he was, he was in such a deeply exalted spiritual state. This is the idea. Now, this is a, an extremely idealistic, romantic picture of the human being. Uh, the idea that through accepting uh, Jesus Christ, one becomes angelic. One, be, one has now entered into the realm of spirit, and the flesh is no longer uh, a difficulty for him. Now, we have seen historically the results of this kind of idea, but what it did in separating from the sacred law, it created the viability within a, a Christian society for secular law, for secular law. In other words, for worldly laws to be brought about by the emperor or by legislation, like now it is used in Parliament or in the United States in Congress, the legislation of laws. So the secular idea is literally that religion has fettered the human being from progression. In other words, in what happened in Christianity, because the Christian world was so deeply uh, suspicious of science, and in fact because they tied their metaphysics to Aristotelian uh, metaphysics, in other words, the transubstantiation of the, the wine and the, the bread into the blood and the flesh. The Catholics don't like to talk about this, but they believed based on Aristotelian physics that this was possible. They based the idea that the, the blood and the flesh were literally blood and flesh. It was not a metaphor. And this was a doctrine within the Catholic Church that they're ashamed of now. When Aristotelian thought began to become challenged. And this happened, oddly enough, from the introduction of Muslim uh, arguments against Aristotelian thought. To have the philosophy was one of the books that was translated into Latin, where Imam al-Ghazali refutes much of what the Aristotelians believed in terms of metaphysics, and he in fact categorically denied the ability for the human intellect to arrive at a sound metaphysic. In other words, what is beyond the physical world. That within certain limitations, the human beings could dis discover things about the natural world. But about the spiritual or other world, it would only in the end be conjecture. Which is what Allah said, that they, they only follow conjecture, ultimately. And from a Muslim perspective, really this does not simply apply to metaphysics, but to the physical world as well. People don't like to admit this, but the vast majority of sciences in the Western civilization are actually based on conjecture. They are theories. Now they watered them down to the masses as fact. We learn them in schools as facts. But those people that actually write the textbooks, or those discoverers and scientists that actually have come up with the theories, they're the ones that know the limitations of their own thought. People learn, for instance, in chemistry, the, um, the table, the chemical table, of the table of elements. And this is a model that human beings have just projected onto the world. It is not reality. It is a model. Now, the model is it's useful, obviously. I mean, they've done extraordinary things with the, the, the chemical table. But we have a limited perspective of what is taking place in the chemical world. We can only assume things based on our own per perceptions. And so we're making hypotheses based on a, a, a configuration of facts that in fact are limited because they're limited by our, our own perspective of it. And this is something that the deeply uh, uh, 
the deeply esteemed scientists amongst them will admit amongst themselves, but it's something that really is not admitted uh, when you're studying chemistry in the classroom. You learn it as if this is reality. It is simply a model for something that we are experiencing. Now, they had a philosopher, Hume, who was from Scotland, who literally destroyed um, this whole idea of absolute knowledge because he came along. Now, the Muslims, the sad thing about it is, is that we knew this a long time ago way before they ever, we knew about this. If you study the Mutakallimun, I mean, they talk about that we cannot determine true cause and effect because our perspective is limited. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that truly knows what is happening. Even in chemical, if you put chemicals together and see reactions and things like this, what is causing the reactions? From a materialist point of view, it's because this and this substance came together. That does not allow in Islam for what we call kharaq al adah which is a break in the chain of events. For instance, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the fire, kuni bardam wa salama, be cool and peaceful, salama. The ulama, the al-Razi says, not only did he say be cool, but he also said be safe. Because it's not simply enough to say be cool because of, of, Allah could have taken the heat out of the fire but still inflicted the same damage that fire uh, will inflict on a human being. So this is a Muslim understanding that fire does not intrinsically burn. It burns by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a material will say, well no, if you, if you put a match to your finger, you're going to burn your finger. Well then they have people that walk on coals and do, do these type things and, and this kind of makes people scratch their head. Right? But the point is, from the Muslim perspective, all of their sciences are conjecture. Now they are useful, but useful within their own limitations. And we should never forget when Newton, this, uh, uh, this giant to the Western civilization, intellectual giant, who gave them the foundations of their physics, this man's physics came into deep questioning at the turn of this century because they recognized it was only limited to a certain model. It did not apply at the subatomic world. It worked very well in dealing with this physical world that we experience every day. But once they started actually looking into the, the atomic world and the subatomic world, they realized that this thing is very limited, this model. Now they think now that they've reached the height. Now! But a hundred years from now, there may be scientists that look back now and say, look at what the darkness these people were in. So Muslims have always had this historical understanding that human knowledge is deeply limited. This is a principle that the Quran gives us to know that knowledge first and foremost is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one that teaches the human being. Allama bil qalam. Allah taught the human being. So knowledge is literally a revelatory process. It is a process in which the human being is given insights based on the power of the intellect that Allah has, has, has endowed it with. Now when it's coupled with revelation, it allows for the human being to literally work within creation and not be a danger to himself or to creation because he has certain parameters that he recognizes that he must stay within as an Adamic human being that is responsible for his actions. Now to give an example in the secular world what happens? In recently in, in the South Pacific there were a group of scientists who were uh, uh, oceanographers, people that study the ocean. Now they had this, uh, they, they were having a problem understanding why is it that plankton and other types of seaweed do not simply take over the ocean. What is it in the ocean that is preventing this uh, seaweed to proliferate in the same way that, for instance, grass will proliferate in an area given the right circumstances because the ocean has all these right circumstances for a limited amount of seaweed. What is stopping it from growing everywhere? So they came up with a hypothesis that it was iron that there was the, min the, the, the mineral iron was lacking. So what they did was they took an area, a five mile radius, and seeded it with iron pellets all over this area. They came back uh, a month later. This was recently in the New York Times. They came back a month later and the entire area was covered with seaweed. It was completely covered with seaweed. They had destroyed the ecosystem of that area completely. One of the scientists who was being interviewed said, 
that several of the people on the boat actually vomited, that they were so horrified. And this was their initial reaction. And then he said, and then we kind of became elated. So the initial reaction, the human gut heart reaction, was they were horrified in that they're like children playing with extremely dangerous toys, you see. They're literally out there experimenting with a system that Allah has set up and balanced to perfection. And it's not for us to ask why there's not seaweed all over the place. It's for us to say, subhanAllah, that Allah has created this thing in perfect balance. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Rahman, that He says, وَوَضْعَ الْمِيزَانِ أَلَّا تَتَغَوْ فِي الْمِيزَانِ He has placed this balance in order that you might not transgress the balance. أَلَّا تَتَغَوْ فِي الْمِيزَانِ وَأَقِيمَ الْوَزْنَ بِالْقِسْطِ And establish this balance with justice. وَلَا تُخْسِرُ الْمِيزَانِ And don't destroy this balance. Now this balance applies at every level of human existence. There is an ecological balance that we literally have the power to destroy based on the linguistic analysis of this, this uh, injunction in the Qur'an. When Allah says, لا تخسر الميزان, He's telling us don't destroy it, which implies we have the ability to destroy it. And so this is what the human being without revelation becomes an extremely dangerous animal. Becomes a dangerous animal because the intellect which has massive power the intellect must be constrained by revelation. If the intellect is not constrained by revelation, then we see what we see, because this is what's happened in our modern world. We have an intellect that is completely gone crazy. And the word in Arabic, aqal, literally means to bind something, to constrain, that this is the point of the intellect. But it's an aqal that is imbued with wahi. What al-Razi, Fakhruddin al-Razi says, when Allah says, Nurun ala nur, He says, wahyun ala aqal. That nur, light upon light is revelation upon the intellect of the human being. Because the intellect itself is an interface for re revelation. It's a, it's, a, it's a receptacle for revelation itself. Revelation cannot be carried by idiots. Allah in the Quran says, uh, This, the likeness of those who carry these, this sacred revelation on their backs, right? Without, like donkeys, they're like donkeys. Because the donkey carries it but doesn't know what's on its back. The donkey has no idea it's carrying knowledge. And this is what happens when, when we take the Qur'an as a book to put on our shelves and we don't actually study it. We don't have it impact the intellect. The Qur'an, if the individual begins to rec recite the Qur'an, it will create a dynamic tension within the human being because it demands thought. The Qur'an demands thought. One of the, main, the dominant modes, rhetorical modes in the Qur'an is what's called ellipsis. This is, this is a mode that is not used in very many languages, and certainly not the English language. It's, it's rarely used. But in Qur'an, the idea of hub is very important. And what this does is it demands the individual to think and reflect. Allah does not give all the information in the Qur'an, but He gives enough information that it can be worked out with thought. One of the most interesting things about the usul of our religion is that the vast majority of rules are based on what the usuliyin call dala'il ghaniyya, which are ambiguous proofs that demand ishtihad. In other words, Allah has given us a deen that is based on individual. The Prophet did not clarify this deen uh, then spell everything out like A, B, C, D. Literally, you will find the Prophet actually gave commentary on very few verses in the Qur'an. If you look in Al-Bukhari, there's a bab, bab al-Tafsir. The Prophet gave commentary on very few verses. He clarified the Qur'an in his behavior. That is the greatest tafsir of Qur'an, literally is the sunnah of the Prophet But the idea of yatadabbarun, afala yatadabbarun al-Qur'an. Don't they contemplate? Don't they ponder? If the Prophet literally told us everything the Qur'an meant, then where would, why would we have to ponder the meanings of the Qur'an? If he spelt it all out for us, 
or the Sahaba. So they didn't do this. Why? Because every generation of Muslims have to take it upon themselves to literally study this book and learn to apply the book to their given contextual circumstances which change with time and place. But the reality of Quran does not change with time and place. It can literally be applied in every time and place which is the unique nature of the matrix of Quran is that it will continue to engender interpretations of any human society. Now in the secular society, by taking revelation out, literally, and the Christians were, were completely done in, the science destroyed them. Science was not able to destroy Islam, and still they have not. The Qur'an, they've tried to find things in it, they, they, really, they gave up on Qur'an, they started focusing on the Hadith. Because the Qur'an, they, 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 it was too difficult for them. The Orientals worked on the Qur'an and literally gave it up as a project to refute the Qur'an. You will find very few books that literally refute the Qur'an. In fact, the only books that they have written actually deal with the differences of the stories in the Old Testament and New Testament and the Qur'anic versions of them. They, they point these out and usually it's simplistic fundamentalist Christians that do this. Uh, real academics actually usually don't do this because once you start poking holes in, 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 in the Bible, pretty soon there's no end to the holes you can poke into it. You see, so the actual, what they begin to realize is the stories in the Quran actually make more sense than the ones in the Bible. And that's the one of the points of the Quran is it's Muhammad. It's actually an overseer and a guardian of previous revelation. They can see where they went astray and where they deviated by going back to the Quran. And they're forced to do this with the Arabic language. The Hebrews now in Tel Aviv and the places where they do sem uh, semantical analysis of the Hebraic language, they are literally forced to go to Arabic because Arabic has been preserved. The Jews didn't start writing dictionaries until after they saw the Muslims do it. It never occurred to them to save and preserve the words at the time when they were revealed. The Muslims began to do this immediately. Ibn Abbas and, and Atta and Mujahid, they were already preserving the meanings of the words. But not only that, the preservation was included within the preservation of the Jahili poetry by, based on contextual meanings of words. So the Quranic Arabic is literally completely preserved. Nobody can come along today and say, this really means this. Because you have to say, what's your proof? And they have to give you a proof from either Jahali Arabic or the way the Arabs understood the meaning of the word based on the preservation of the Arabic language through the great lexicographers of this ummah like Ibn Manbur, al Firuz Abadi, Wal Asma'i, who was a great collector of meanings of, of Hadith Rah of Rispahani, who literally collected all of the absolutely preserved meanings of this book. So the language was literally completely preserved. And more than that, it is so deeply scientific in its nature because the precision of the meaning. Now one of the great things of the secular worldview is literally a, 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 a semi-religious vocabulary is given to human beings in which they are indoctrinated through the secular school system. So by the time an individual comes out of the secular school system, he has completely absorbed a worldview. This is the purpose of the secular school system is to adopt a worldview. Now this worldview has key vocabulary. In the same way with what the Qur'an did when it came down during the time, it took words that the Arabs knew and it added new dimensions. One of the, for example, as Najib Abbas pointed out about the word Kareem. Kareem to the Yahri Arabs was a man who was extravagantly generous. But it was based often on his lineage, his tribal nobility. So he had to uphold the name of his tribe, like Hatam Apa'i. Because Hatam Apa'i was Apa'i, which was a generous tribe, and he was their Sayyid, he had to be more generous than anybody else in order to maintain his Karam. And if he would, uh, if he would renege, on that obligation, which was a tribal obligation, as well as his own sense of personal uh, obligation. It was a tribal obligation because the Arabs did not like to dishonor their tribes. So Karam had this meaning. What Islam did, the Qur'an literally ties the meaning of Karam. And it becomes inextricably bound with the idea of Taqwa. That Karam cannot exist without Taqwa. Inna akramukum indallahi atqaakum. So Allah has permanently bound the idea of nobility 
and generosity with the idea of taqwa. And this can never be broken now within the Arabic language. Because this is, the revelation itself is giving people a world view, a new way of perceiving reality. This world view, unfortunately, the Muslims have literally had it taken from them and they have, it, have had it replaced with a secular world view. And therefore we have Muslims that literally articulate the world view of the secularists without having any idea that they're doing it. In, in other words, their minds have literally been colonized. You can colonize a human being's body, but once the chains are broken, you no longer possess him. But once you colonize his mind, you can break the bonds of, of, of slavery, this, this perceived slavery, and you have a slave forever as long as his mind is enslaved, enslaved and, and enchained. You see, and this is what happened. The colonials literally came in, and this was the secular worldview. They dealt with Christianity. They destroyed in the United States the Catholic and the, the Catholic Church had the best form of education. They were indoctrinating their people with a religious perspective. The Protestants literally saw their own Protestants began to go into the Catholic because Protestantism is secularized Catholicism. That's all it is. It is secularized Catholicism. For instance, according to the Roman Catholic Church, usury is one of the grave sins that will put somebody in the hellfire. They believe this in the same way that we believe it based on the Old Testament and based on Jesus, according to them, turning the user's tables up in the temple and condemning them. The Catholics, in fact Dante in his Divine Comedy, which is really just a, a, a plagiarized rip-off of the Mi'raj, and that's all he did, the seven heavens and the seven hells and seeing all these things, he just ripped it off from a description he found in Arabic, and it's considered one of the classics of Western civilization. But in the, and then, A'udhu he, Billah, he, he, he in his sick and distorted mind puts the Prophet in, in the hellfire. You see, this is what he does. He stole the whole idea from the Muslims and, and, and that's his thanks. And, and, and we know where he's going to be. See, he's going to be SubhanAllah. So this, what, what Dante did, he put the homosexuals and the sodomites in the same place in hell. What they call now homosexuals, they used to call them sodomites. In fact, they don't even use homos, they say gay. The sodomites he placed in the same circle of hellfire as the users. Why did he do that? Because sodomy according to the Catholic understanding, was a crime against nature. It was against the nature for a male to have a sexual, physical relationship with another male. That is against nature. And anyone that says otherwise is a sick human being. And the Qur'an talks about when they chase Muth out, the reason they chase him out is because he was purified. So it shows you the sickness of their, in other words, they're so sick that the impurity becomes the norm and the purity becomes the deviance. And this is a sociological principle. Deviation does not mean in sociology, in the same understanding as the Quran, deviation does not mean the bad thing. It means when the norm is good, then evil is deviant. But when evil is the norm, good becomes deviant. And this is how the Quran perceives it. And that's why the Prophet said, كَيْفَ أَنْتُمْ إِذَا أَصْبَحَ عِنْدُكُمْ الْمُنْكَرُ الْمَعْرُوفُ مُنْكَرَ How will you be when the munkar, the, the wrong thing, becomes the right thing? This is what he said. In other, and this is a deep sociological understanding of human society. How will you be when the wrong thing becomes the right thing? And they said, أَسَيُكُونُ ذَلِكَ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Will that happen, Ya Rasulullah? He said, بَلْ أَشْهَبْ Even worse than that. They said, what could be worse than that? He said, كيف أنتم إذا تأمرون بالمنكر وتنهون عن المعروف? What will happen to you when you actually enjoin wrong and forbid, when you enjoin wrong and forbid right? When the actual criterion of human society is completely turned upside down, so righteousness is deviance, 
And it's something that is, right now in, in, in societies, to be religious is a, a, a psychological neurosis. That if you are religious, if you cry out of fear of God, they will say he's suffering from neurotic religiosity. You see, this is what they'll say. And, and the psychiatrist will actually try to cure you of this by letting you know that don't feel bad about yourself. You know, that it, th these taboos are simply social norms. You see, they just change with the times. You see, I mean, in the 19th century, for a woman in England to show her ankle was considered risque. She was actually considered a, a, a loose woman. This is in England. Now, subhanAllah, try to make a phone call in this city. <laughs> Seriously. And unbelievable. So this is the complete transformation of the goodness as a norm to evil becoming a norm. Now the, the danger of this is that the heart becomes accustomed to it. You see, the Prophet said, If one of you sees a wrong, a munkar, let him change it. And he said, بِيَدِهِ let him change it first with his hand, literally. So if you see a pornographic picture, you rip it down, right? And if he can't do that, then with his tongue, you should speak out against it. And if he can't do that, then at least reject it in his heart. And that is the weakest of Iman. And which means, لَيْسَ وَرَاهُ iman. There's no Iman after that. Now what happens when you live in a society where munkar is the ma'roof? The human heart literally becomes accustomed to it and you stop, even your own heart, stop seeing it as something that's wrong. You see, which, which is what happens if, if you, it's a stable boy who cleans, with, cleans out the manure all day long. Now when you go into the stable, what's that? You know, what a horrific smell. And the sta stable boy says, what smell? Because he's accustomed to the smell of manure. And this is what happens when Muslims come from somewhat traditional cultures. When they first get to England, they go into shock. They do. They go into shock. They can't believe it. They can't believe their eyes. How can human beings do it? You bring somebody from the Swat Valley. I mean, unfortunately, now they have satellite discs so they can watch it all on television. But if you bring somebody from the Mauritanian desert where I was, who's never even seen uh, haram things, and, and put him in life, he'll, he'll think he's arrived to another planet. That this is hell or something like that. He'll think that he died and he's in hell. But here we are, it's just become a norm. It's become a norm. You just say, oh, Malish, you know, you're in London. Hauna London. <laughs> like Big Ben when it rings on BBC Arabic broadcasts. Hauna London. In, in Mauritania, they had a, a Bedouin who, he was out in the middle of the Sahara and somebody brought a radio and he'd never seen a radio. And then they turned on the BBC and it said, bong, bong, and they said, Huna, London. He said, this is Tijikje? It's not London. What's he talking about? You bring a box that's telling lies. <laughs> you see, because the Arabs, if they say Huna, it means here. You have to say Hunak. <laughs> so he said, this is, I had a mole London, I had a tzigzig, and a rabbi. And a I think I'm stupid or so, I know where I am, but the box doesn't know where it is. <laughs> So this idea, again, of stripping people of a traditional worldview, which included the Christians, the next move was the Muslims. The next move was the Muslims. And the Chinese as well. You see, the, because the Chinese scare them. They, they had to literally inundate that country with opium. It was done here by merchants. The, 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 the emperor, the Chinese emperor, wrote a letter to the Queen of, Queen of, uh, to the Queen of England, Queen Victoria, and said, uh, that there's these barbarians that are from your country, they're obviously pirates, and they're coming selling drugs to the people here. And she sent a, a gunboat to defend them. And he found out later that they were noblemen from England. He thought they were like criminals, you see, because they were dealing drugs, and that's what criminals do. They were noblemen. Some of them were MPs in the in the parliament. And this completely shattered the Chinese perception of the uh, of the English. 
there's a barbarian people because they didn't have that concept that somebody, a noble person would deal drugs. You give them a title and call them an earl or a duke. In fact, the more drugs they deal, the higher up they go on their social hierarchy. That's true. The more damage you've done to the world in England, the higher you are up. So the dukes are worse than the knights. They're the, you know, it's like having a petty criminal and a big criminal. And then you have the, the, the major players, right? And they, they give them crowns and things like that. And gold, all these big... They have Muslims walking around with these things now. Have you, subhanAllah. Muslims walking around with a cross. You know, in, in the books of fiqh, that's called ridda. <laughs> it's called apostasy. To put on a zinar, which was the, the Christian belt that the Vimyun used to wear, was considered ridda. It was apostasy for a Muslim to do that. And now they, they're all honored. I've been honored, you know, I'm the Lord Mayor. Now Allah says, Surah al rum is a fascinating, I mean the whole of Quran is extraordinary, but Surah al rum is an interesting surah to read from the perspective of the title. And there are secrets in the titles of the Quran, no doubt. Rome literally means the Europeans, and by, by uh, continuation the Americans. The Americans are new Romans, and this is a Roman culture, it's a Roman civilization, it's actually called the Greco-Roman culture. The, uh, the Judeo-Christian is a, an appellate that came in the 20th century, when they started accepting the Christian. When the Jews gained more and more power, they began to add these things, right? And now you've got the, the Pope uh, apologizing. Uh, for saying, for even intimating that the Christians ever, the Jews ever killed Jesus, even though their own book says that. So he apologized for blaming the Jews for that. Now we solved the problem, because we said, no, they didn't do it, they're innocent. What they're guilty of is rejecting him, and they killed other prophets, but in terms of Jesus, we, alhamdulillah, we say they didn't kill him, so... We, we solve all these problems. We could solve Ireland's problem overnight, they just become Muslim. And then you don't have Protestant Catholics. But the problem is they probably have would become Sunnis, they have become Shia, and they just carry on anyway. <laughs> now in Surah to Rome, Allah talks about Rome being conquered and then saying that they will conquer. And saying that the Mu'mineen would be happy about that. Now the reason they would be happy about that, and don't forget this, is because they were Christians. They were Ahlul Kitab. These Romans are no longer Christians. Now they, they are the Dalek Christians in the sense that they still use the appellage. And they still have a, uh, a stake in maintaining some semblance of a Christian inheritance. But the reality of it is the Christians completely reject this. If you read modern Christian literature, most of the Christians writing today actually consider this to be like Babylon. All right, I've read a lot of their literature and they condemn what's happened in this uh, world as much as the Muslims would from a moral perspective. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He says that this is the promise of Allah, wa'ad Allah, then he, he tells us, لا يخلف الله وعده Allah never breaks His promise. And then reminds us, ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون But the majority of people do not know. They don't know this. And then Allah says, after making a negation of knowledge, ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون This is called nafi. Then Allah makes it bad. يعلمون ظاهرا من الحياة الدنيا They know the outward of this world. This is their knowledge. They know the outward of this world. وهم عن الآخرة هم غافلون But they are completely heedless of the next world. This is the secular world view. Is that they have reduced all of science to investigating the world, to manipulating, to conquering, and to controlling. The Romans and the Greeks believed that there was a tension between the gods 
and nature, they saw that there was this tension between nature and the human being, that nature was antagonistic to the human being. This is not the Islamic worldview. Allah tells us that He literally سَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Allah has subjugated to you all that is in the heavens and the earth. Tasheer is divine from Allah. There is a divine subjugation of nature to the human being. And we have proven this now that we are literally transforming nature because of a sickness, because we don't have these constraints of divine law. But Allah reminds us that the entire creation has been subjugated for us. Now a subject is exactly that, somebody under your control. And this necessitates responsibility. And this is why Allah has made the human being Khalifa. Now a Khalifa, inni ja'idun fil ardi Khalifa. I am placing in the earth a Khalifa. This is the role of the Adamic man and the Adamic woman is to become literally a caretaker of the earth itself. And Allah says after telling us, وَلَا تُفْسِدُوا الْمِيزَانِ وَلَا تُخْسِرُوا الْمِيزَانِ Allah reminds us, وَالْأَرْضَ وَضْعَهَا لِلْأَنَامِ The earth has been literally placed for all living creatures. There is a hierarchy. And human beings are literally at the top of that hierarchy. We are at the top. But the hierarchy is necessary for the... We cannot be at the top if we destroy everything underneath us. We literally undermine the hierarchy itself. So the king doesn't want to destroy his subjects because once he destroys them, he's no longer king. You see, once he destroys them, he no longer has, he's not Khalifa. So by destroying this divine hierarchy that Allah has established, we literally undermine our own authority on the earth. So we have been challenged by Allah to maintain this divine hierarchy. That we literally take care of the earth. The Prophet said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَهَذِهِ الْأَرْضِ in Tabarani. Beware of this earth. وَإِحْتَفِظُوا مِنْهَا and be vigilant about her. فَإِنَّهَا أُمُّكُمْ Because she is your mother. وَسَتَشْهَدُوا لِكُلِّ مَنْ ظَلَمَهَا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ And she will bear witness against everyone who has oppressed her. That, uh, and one of the aspects of this is بِرْ الْوَالِدَةِ That we literally show a, a righteousness to the mother that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us forth from her, her dust. From her Torah, she is the matrix from which the Adamic creature came out of. And this is why there is a rabita quite literally with the earth and the mother. And because the mother has been abused in this civilization, reduced to, to the lowest of the low, there is literally no elevation of the mother. Why a, a stewardess or a prostitute has a higher status because she's a wage earner in this culture than a mother who is literally bringing about the next generation of human beings. And because people when they are treated in that way don't expect from them except to not fulfill their obligations. Teachers in the same way all over the world, teachers are literally considered one of the lowest occupations. In the Muslim world when Islam was powerful and established, the Mu'allim was literally the highest. قُمْ لِلْمُعَلِّمَ وَبَجِّلْ لَهُ تَبْجِيلًا كَادِ الْمُعَلِّمَ وَنْيُكُونَ رَسُولًا Get up for your teacher and show him respect. This teacher is almost a prophet from God. This is how the Muslims understood what ta'lim was. خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرَانَ وَعَلَّمَ The best of you are those who learn the Qur'an and teach it. And this is what the mu'allim was. The mu'allim was literally, and it's not for nothing that the mu'allim, they call the mu'allim is the rada' al-thani. The teacher is the, the, wet, the second wet nurse. And there is a feminine aspect of teaching because it takes rahmah. This is why the Prophet said one of the things they used to accuse him of being like a woman. This is one of the things that the Quraysh accused him of being too feminine, that he wasn't like masculine. He wasn't uh, a macho man like the Arab. They like, you know, like one of the Arabs said, يُبْكَ عَلَيْنَا وَلَا نَبْكِ عَلَىٰ أَحْدًا لَنَحْنُ أَغْلَرُ أَكْبَادًا مِنَ الْإِبْدِي People weep over us, we don't weep over anybody. We have livers like camels. 
to deliver the seed of emotion. When Al-Aqra ibn Habas al-Tamimi and Bani Tamim, very interesting tribe from the Nez that Allah revealed in his, his Quran about them, وَأَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ Most of them have no understanding. And that with deference to any Tamimis here. But the, well, he said, Akhtarum, not all of them. So inshallah, if you are a Tamimi, then you're from those who understand. But this man, Al-Aqra ibn Habiz al-Tamimi, came to the Prophet and the Prophet him kissed his child, which is something the Arabs did not do, because it was feminine. It was like acting like a mother. That's what mothers do to their children, especially in front of people. See, they might say, I don't do that. But then when they go home, they're kissing and hugging, right? Because they're trying to be macho, like the macho people. The Prophet kissed him in front of this Arab. And he says, you kiss children? I have ten children, I haven't kissed one of them. And the Prophet said, Do I have anything in this deen for somebody Allah has taken rahma out of his heart? Do I have anything in this deen for somebody who Allah has taken rahma out of his heart? So this, the honoring of the mother, and by extension, the word in Arabic, tayammum, if you look it up, one of the meanings is literally to take a mother. That's one of the meanings of tayammum in the Arabic language. It literally, one of the meanings is to take a mother, tayammum, tayammama. He took a mother. So this idea of secularization commodifies, because nothing is sacred. The earth has no uh, sanctity, no inviability. It can be raped in the same way women are raped. In this society, prostitution is literally, it, women are encouraged to become prostitutes. Modeling is actually a high calling. We call that prostitution in Islam. She's selling her body. Whether or not she sleeps with people is irrelevant. She's literally commodified her body. And this is a high calling, film stars, actresses and all these things. These are forms of prostitution as far as Islam is concerned. Voyeurism of people watching people make love on a screen. Or not, we can't even say make love, it's just having sex like animals. You see? And so this is literally, these, these are, people are encouraged to do these things. And if, if a woman like becomes a model, all her friends are so excited. Why, there, there was a time in any human culture on the earth that they would literally, the parents would weep, tears, tears in how the, what they perceive has happened, you see. So this idea of womanhood and the preservation of womanhood is so essential to the Islamic worldview and something that secularism must destroy in order for it to be maintained. Secularism must destroy this, a this aspect, this element. So the earth itself becomes a uh, uh, some, something that can be raped and pillaged. That's even they use those words, to be raped and pillaged. And these things take place. Now the, the Islamic Sharia literally came down for the preservation of human societies and for the preservation of the, the, the human being. In order for it to be nurtured, for the human being to grow, to become fully human, to realize its humanity. And this, this is something that in the Muslim world, we have been so distanced from the Islamic worldview that we have many Muslims that literally believe that the Sharia is no longer applicable in, 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 in the times that we're living in. There are Muslims that believe that the, the Sharia is no longer uh, viable to be applied. And the, we have to recognize the Quran and the Sunnah cannot be applied piecemeal. You can't take parts of it and leave others. It is a total integral system. That when it's applied in its integrity, it succeeds in its purpose, which is to establish human societies and humane societies whereby people are preserved and protected and can worship their Lord and families are protected. But when it's used as the tyrants use it, because the hudud can be used uh, as a tyrannical system. The Prophet told us the hukm al-jahiliya was that they aqam al-had al al-faqir wa tarak al-ghani that they establish the had punishment on a poor person and they leave the rich people. Which in the few countries now that claim to follow Islamic law, this is what they do. They apply to the poor people and they leave the rich people. This is jahiliya. It's the same thing. Now, the Muslim, because they've been completely secularized, the most important thing, I want to move, inshallah, now just to looking at what, the getting out of this mess. The most important thing to recognize is literally that our world views have been taken from us. There is a Quranic world view, and it is very different from this world view. It places Akhirah over dunya. 
The secular worldview places dunya paramount over and above everything and really does not believe in anything beyond dunya. They believe that the ultimate knowledge is to pursue worldly knowledges, that other worldly knowledges are a waste of time. They don't encourage people to do these things. Even their theological uh, departments in the universities have completely died out because they don't, they don't, the only people in the theology department now are lesbians and homosexuals that are trying to prove their whole point of view, really. In a, in, when I was at Harvard University, uh, I asked somebody, how do you get, a, get appointed here on the, on the faculty in the religious department? And he said, well, it helps if you're gay or, or lesbian. That's a plus and definitely an atheist, you see. So this is what they've reduced religion to. So the dunya is placed over akhirah. In fact, they don't even recognize akhirah, which is what Allah says, They literally do not, they're in complete heedlessness about the akhirah. What Allah tells us literally is, Allah is aqrabu ilaykum min hablil warid. He's nearer to you than your own carotid artery. This is how close Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, meaning that literally death and the presence of Allah is not only inevitable, but literally presenting us in every moment. We are literally presented with the inevitability of our own mortality. So part of the Islamic worldview is to literally embrace death. To embrace death. The Prophet sallallahu said, أَذْكَرُوا أَكْثِرُوا مِنْ ذِكْرِكُمْ هَذَ مَنْ do much remembrance of the destroyer of delights. Now it's a very beautiful term that the Arabs used for death, the destroyer of delights. One of the things that you will notice in this dunya, this secularized dunya, is it's all about delights. It's all about pleasure. All this is constantly being thrust onto the people. And this is the media element within this secularized society. Even cigarettes, they'll have advertisements say, taste the pleasure. Right? I mean, it's literally killing them. <laughs> that is Hadam al the, the cigarette is literally one of the destroyers of pleasure, and they're telling you it's pleasure itself. This is how clever they are. I mean, if they can convince you of that. I, w I literally watched a woman die uh, of respiratory failure. Watched her die right before my eyes. And her last words were a jingle from Chesterfield. Uh, which was a popular cigarette in the 1940s when she began smoking. And she literally, those were her last words, were a jingle from Chesterfield, and then she cursed them. She says, those lying son of a bitches. That's what she said. And I watched her die, literally uh, because of, of uh, uh, smoking cigarettes. That was the cause. And she, she was singing the jingle and cursing them. But you see, in the end of the day, you believe the jingle. You see, I and mean, we have to take responsibility for our actions. And this is what they want to do, put all this massive propaganda. And the dangerous thing is our children. We have intellects. We have aql. The children's aql is developing. And if you allow it to develop within this context, you will destroy your children. They will become dunyawi people. They will not become ukhrawi people because this is what the entire society is telling them is the goal of life. The one with the most toys at the end wins, right? This is what they say in America, they have a bumper sticker. The one with the most toys in the end wins. And somebody said, well, you still have to die, right? I mean, yeah, you have all the toys at the end, but then you don't take them with you. So really, do we call that winning? So the goal of life for these people is just to gain and acquire more. And this again is in the Qur'an, clearly articulated the consumer mentality. The human being says, I have consumed vast quantities of wealth. They actually boast. And this is something people do, and Muslims are caught up in this, of how many bangles they have. Some of these women talk about bangles all, all day long. They have bangles for brains, really. SubhanAllah. I mean, I, uh, Fatima didn't even wear gold. The best of creation's daughter didn't even wear gold, which isn't to say it's haram. But she was setting an example. The Prophet did not wear her to wear gold because, one, he wanted her to be an example. I mean, alhamdulillah, gold is a halal thing, and I'm not telling women to throw away, but to acquire and collect until your arms are up to you. You can't even move your arms because you've got so much gold on it, and you're weighted down. You know, I mean, what kind of, this is not embellishment, really. It's being shackled to the dunya. 
So the, the media, we have to understand the role of the media in the secularization. Now, just to look at a few things within the media to recognize the, the deep psych psychological impact. And I want to use children's media because we have, we have, many of us have children. The Muppets, if you watch the Muppets, a lot of people don't know this, but Bert and Ernie are homosexual. It's not a joke. They're literally homosexuals in the mind of the creator of the Muppets. And it was something that they actually wanted to admit at a certain point to the little kitties. Get them used to Bert and Ernie, they love Bert and Ernie, and then Bert and Ernie come out and tell them, you know why we're living together, right? Now this is a Muppet, it's imagination, but it's very odd for Muslim children, instead of having a family, like a, a mother and a father and thing, there's Bert and Ernie, one of them cooks, where's the, really, one of them is the feminine one, and the other is the masculine one. And your children watching that, and we don't really know the deep implications of a lot of these television programs. And this is not a joke, because these people have psychologists working for them. If you go to Madison Avenue, uh, many of the people that work in advertising agencies have PhDs in psychology. They've literally studied how to manipulate. A lot of the ads that you see are literally, they're not, a lot of times you see people in these contorted positions and things like that. Very unnatural. If you try to imitate some of these ads, seriously, look at them. They're very unnatural, uh, contorted. It all has to do with subliminal of impact. And there's many books written about this. If you look at a film like Aladdin, Aladdin has a deep message to children. One of the messages, the most dominant message is you can obey your father and he'll forgive you in the end disobey your father and he'll forgive you in the end. The other thing is an undermining of the idea of Sharia because the whole film revolves around a law that says the princess cannot marry a commoner and this has to do with the idea of Sharia, with tradition. Do you see? So it undermines the idea of tradition because all she keeps talking about is why do I have to follow this tradition? And this is a deep subliminal message to children. When the parents try to instill in them traditional values, they remember Aladdin and oh yeah, that's like Princess Jasmine, she had to do this and, and that was, and in the end she didn't do it and her father still loved her, you see. There's a, there's a, uh, a commercial in America where they had a soldier, he's driving in a taxi to his home and he's in his nice shining marine suit, butched hair and he comes in and he gets off the car and you see he's very hesitant and reluctant to go up to the door. And then finally the door opens and there's this very stern father looking there with his face frowning. And then he sees his son and he goes back to the son and the son looks very apprehensive. And then they both break out in a smile and they go embrace each other. Now, why would they do a commercial like that? Because there are many people who have sons now of the military age who were war resistors in the 1960s. And they don't want their children to go into the army. They don't want them to be part of this military industrial complex. And so these commercials are, and you watch them with football games. That's when they come on, when these young 18 year olds are watching it. So there's deep psychological messages being uh, thrust into the minds of these people that are literally in a hypnagogic, passive, receptive state, uncritical mode. Another example is the uh, Little Mermaid. Again, the, the daughter betrays the father. The father's this stern, mean person that wants to follow tradition, and the mother goes against him. Again, the same thing happens. In the end, it all works out, everybody's happy. The message is, if you get pregnant and you're out of wedlock, well, your father's going to forgive you anyway. Right? And this is the message that they're giving to children out of these things. So Muslims have to be deeply aware of this, that you're not, it's not this innocent, harmless thing that's taking place. No, there is indoctrination taking place. People have a worldview. The creator of Bart Simpson was interviewed, I read this interview and he said that he was an anarchist that did not believe in authority. And he said, but he realized that the best way to get his views across was to make people laugh. And if you watch Bart Simpson, I don't encourage this, 
right? But Bart Simpson is all about undermining authority, making fun of the principal, the school, the authority of the school, making fun of the father. He's constantly making fun of the father, what a buffoon his father is. You see, so this is what happens. Now, the, uh, the same thing, there was a film uh, called The Goofy Movie, which was a Disney film for children. The film basically completely mocked school and education. And the aspiration of this child was to become a rock star. Now, this is something you're taking your little child to see, thinking it's some innocent film by Walt Disney, that great lover of, of children and good, wholesome, clean entertainment. People don't know that Touchdown, Touchstone Productions, which is a pornographic uh, film production company, is owned by Disney. That's how they, they, Disney is for the PG and the G film. Touchstone is for the, the, the films that have pornography and sex and, and, and these type of things in it. So these people have no family values. They have no family, they're only looking for a market. That's all they are. They're looking literally for a market. And they want to uh, commodify the people. And so literally, uh, all these films that they make, you have toys that come out of it, so the children are, learn to become consumers. They go see the film, and then they want the doll, and they want the tennis shoes, and they want the t-shirt, and they want the hat. So they learn to become consumers, which this is the goal of the, of the secular society, is to make everyone a consumer. Now the word consumer in the old English language means devil. That's what it means. Consumer in old English means the devil. And Allah says that the Mubaddirin are ikhwanu shayateen, the extravagant consumers are the brothers of the shayateen. This is what Allah says. So conspicuous consumption is literally a, 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 a shaitanic activity. People now when they get depressed, instead of going to the masjid, they go to the mall. They go to the store. They go to shop. And this is a fact. Sociologically, you can read all the studies. People when they get depressed, they go shop. If they don't have money, they just pull out their credit cards. Which is the next thing, go moving from the media to the economics of the secular society. The economics of the secular society is to make every single human transaction a ribawi transaction. Every single one. When you pull out your credit card, that is a ribawi transaction. There's a middleman which is called a simsar in Arabic, a samsara. And this form of samsara is, is not permissible. It's literally haram in Islamic law. So what you do is when you buy with your credit card, there is a, a somebody in a bank somewhere that's getting three, four to six percent out of that transaction between two individuals. And now in Sharia we have no hukum that allows that, that permits that. Between two buyers and sellers, no third person can come in there like that and, and get money out of that transaction. And yet, this is what they want every single transaction to be, where you're literally being charged by this third party for human transactions of buying and selling. The Prophet ﷺ said, You should go on yati ala nas zaman kulluhum ya'kuluna riba. There is coming a time on humankind where all of them will be consuming riba. And he said, وَمَنْ لَا يَأْكُلُهُ يُغَبَّرُ بِغُبَارِهَا Or يُصَابُ بِغُبَارِهَا And the one that is not eating it will be covered in its dust. You see? And this is the age we're in. So the bankers are consolidating their power and making all of our transactions ribawi transactions, which is the most haram form of transaction. And the Prophet ﷺ likened it to inviolating the mother. You see, this is likened in the hadith to in violating your own mother. And in one riwayah, and there's sound hadith, that it's like in violating your mother, fornicating with your mother in the shade of the Kaaba. And people say, how is, I had somebody tell me, how is that possible that riba could be to this level? When you begin to study riba and the effects it has on society, riba literally is one of the main causes of prostitution. Seriously. 
It's one of the main causes of prostitution worldwide. The worldwide poverty that exists today, the basis of it is because of the riba system. If you want to understand why South America is in the condition it's in, you have to understand the World Bank and the IMF policies that are, are usury policies. People talk about the rainforest being destroyed and how the oxygen is going to all wear out and they don't know that the oxygen, the rainforest is being destroyed because Brazil has massive debt, they have to pay interest on their debt so they make cash crops or they graze cattle so you can eat your McDonald's hamburger for 99 cents in America and I don't know what it is here. I only know it's 99 cents because I see it advertised. I have never bought one. I don't want to buy one. I mean, we used to have an understanding of baraka in food, which is the next thing you see, economics, look at food. The Qur'an is a shifa. It's not only a healing for the, body, the, for the mind, but for the body as well. It commands us to fast. The Prophet says, Sumu tasihu. Fast and you will become healthy. Kutiba alaykum al siyam. Kama kutiba ala ladina min qabrikum. La'alakum tattaqoon. There is a relationship between the way you eat and the way you behave. Ahmed Zarruq said, Kul ma shi'ta fa midruka taf'al. Eat whatever you want, but know that you're going to do whatever you eat. In akalta halalan, amalta halalan ragma amfika. If you eat halal, you will do halal in spite of yourself. Wa in akalta haraman, amalta haraman ragma amfika. And if you eat haram, you will do haram in spite of yourself. They asked the Prophet, how do we make our dua mustajab? He said, tayyib ta'amik yustajab. Make pure your food and Allah will answer your prayer. When the people of the cave came out of the cave, the first thing he said, go get food and look for the purest food. Azka fa'ama, look for the purest food. And Muslims, they have completely abandoned it. Food made with the love of, 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 of whoever's making it, the cook. Because uh, women shouldn't cook all the time. <laughs> Men should cook for their wives. Think about this. The man says, but, but I work 40 hours a week, and I come home, I expect her to cook my meal for me. First of all, it's not wajib, unless you're Maliki, which I am, but it's not wajib. <laughs> she doesn't have to cook. But then, think about this. You work 40 hours a week, maybe. I mean, most, most people nowadays uh, in the Muslim countries don't even work 20 minutes a day. They did a study, a sociological study in Egypt and found that the average bureaucrat in Egypt did 20 minutes of work a day. So you can imagine why the country is in the state it's in. They, they spend the morning reading the Ahram and then the afternoon talking about it. And every once in a while they say, give a shay, bring the tea. <laughs> and their work is probably just signing some paper every, or taking the rushwa or something like that. That's a little work there. <laughs> Bakshish. Okay? I mean, seriously. Then they go home, the woman who has five children, who's been literally sweating her brow all day long, and he says, Jeeb al akal Sain al akal Where's the food? This man has been working so hard all day, it's like the woman doesn't do any work at home. Really. That's the hardest job. Just seriously, take your children, if you have children, take them for one day, Just take them for one hour, and, and then see, really make an analogy of what your wife is doing. So if she's cooking your meals seven days a week, that, that's unjust. That is unjust. You have to, just like you get a weekend from your work, the woman should have a weekend from her work as well. That only, that only sounds just, doesn't it? It only sounds fair. That we should be giving our women some alleviation. The reason we have so many disgruntled women is because we treat them that way that creates that atmosphere. So the food is important. Now if you've got a woman that's cursing you while she's cooking your food, <laughs> that's going to have an impact. You, get, you wonder why I have indigestion or, you know. <laughs> she's saying, <laughs> so we have to eat good food. Now the meat, I'm going to mention something about meat because this is part of the secular world. is to create, turn people into meat consumers. Because meat is very profitable. And if you study the history of the western people, their history is a history of literally destroying sheep people for cattle. You can read that. There's a book that I recommend for you to read called 
Beyond Beef by Jeremy Rifkin, which is a history of cattle. Now there is a hadith sahih that the Prophet said, Lahm al-Baqar da'un wa al shifa is the sahih hadith. The, the meat of the cow is a disease and the milk is a, is a healing. Now we know that uh, Ibrahim salam, ate meat and he brought meat. The Ajr and Samin. He came with a, a good calf. And the meat is definitely, beef meat is permissible. But eating beef meat continuously brings on many diseases. This is absolutely confirmed in medical science. They have no doubt about the deleterious impact of particular beef meat, which is a, has a, a great deal of, uh, of fat, but it, it literally hardens the heart. Now there is a tradition from Sayyidina Ali saying, beware of much consumption of meat because it pulls rahmah out of the heart. And in one uh, tradition it says, al qalb, it makes the hard heart. Now it literally does that physically. It, 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 it uh, destroys the elasticity of the heart and oxygen does not get to the heart. So there's an impact. Now, th there are only two hadiths in the Muat of Imam Madik de dealing with meat. Both of them are warning people about meat. And we know there's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet praised meat, meat is Sayyid al-Qa'am, all these things. But the Prophet, according to Imam Al-Qurtubi, لم يعتمده ولم يبحث عنه إن وجده أكده He did not take it as his staple diet, nor did he seek it out. When he found it, he ate it. And they did not eat a lot of meat. And I contest anybody who has been born a Muslim, if your grandfather is still alive and they're not from a wealthy family, ask them how often they ate meat in the Muslim world. People literally, I know Yemenis who told me in Yemen, they had meat maybe once a month. Twice a month. Some people only on the Eid times. And then when they had meat, they just used to be literally hardly any sprinkled on the, the food. Now the other thing is traditionally the Muslims did not eat beef. It's not a traditional meat of the Muslims. The Muslims ate sheep. But the beef eaters, in fact they, the British have the, you know, the beef eater. That's literally a British uh, uh, in the army, right? They have the beef eaters. And literally these people force beef on people, longhorns. In, in America, they kill the buffalo to make way for the cows, for the cattle. They completely wiped out millions, over 25 million buffaloes were killed in order to destroy the, the economic basis of the Indian, the Native American nations. But they also fought and opposed the sheep farmers because sheep farmers are humble according to the, the, the tradition of the prophet. The ones that follow sheep, they learn humility. This is a hadith. And that's why the, the, the prophet said that there was never a prophet except that he looked after sheep. Now beef creates arrogance. People that literally uh, raise beef can become arrogant. So the, this American thing is beef, Texas beef, steaks, all these things. But read that book. The other thing, they fill it with massive hormones and steroids and all of these things. So you're not, it's, it might be halal if it's sacrificed, but is it tayyib? And this is something you have to ask yourself. Halal and tayyibah. Eat halal and pure, tayyib. And that means pure in all of the, the aspects of it. And taba, one of the things of taba is to be good. Imam Malik says in the Muatta that Omar said, "Iyakum wa laham, fa inna lahu darawa ka darawa al khamar." Beware of meat because it has an addiction, like the addiction of wine. People get addicted to it, and then people don't thank Allah. Meat is something that when you eat it, it should be a blessing and a gift that you say, "Alhamdulillah," and you teach your children that. But if they get used to it every day, Ibn al-Had says, don't give your children good food every day with like uh, idam, what he called idam. Get them used to having food that's not always really tasty and all these things, so that they are, they are thankful and grateful and appreciate what they have. This is, this is tarbiya of the Muslims. You can see this in our book, that's a book from the 5th century of Islam. So th this is important. Really, as food, of eating healthy food and raising our children on healthy food. And then the next thing that follows that is medicine, because there is a secularization of medicine as well. The medicine, the, the, you have the military industrial complex, you also have the medical industrial complex. Medicine is a massive industry, billions and billions of dollars. In the United States alone, over $500 billion a year. It's bigger than their war industry, you see. 
and they have ma massive conflicts of interest. What they do, much of the medicine that is used, and if there's any doctors in here, then w without deference to you, because Muslim doctors should really question things and shouldn't just take all these things face value. We have a, a thib, we have a thib in the Islamic tradition, and which doesn't negate that you can progress and learn new things and all these things, but we should not take the theories of medicine as, as absolute fact. Because much of the medicine that exists now is based on maintenance of illness, of not getting people better, but of maintaining illness. So you end up, if you go to a doctor, they give you pills, before you know it, you're literally getting a, a pharmacy bill every month. And then these bills disturb your biochemical uh, balance in the body so much that you can't go off them, it becomes dangerous to stop taking the pills. Now, I'm not saying, some people need, I'm not saying give up all, if people are on medicine, I'm definitely not saying throw away your medicine. But what I'm saying is, if you do become ill, look at all the possible alternatives. Much of our illness is from the way we eat, because we don't exercise. If you look at Muslims, they look unhealthy. Seriously, they look unhealthy. The National Institute of Health in the United States, which is their, that's their icon, that's their major, it's like what they say, it's like Sahih al-Bukhari with us. They said 85% of the illness in the United States is directly related to diet and lack of exercise. But if you go to a doctor, he doesn't say eat well and exercise, he said take this pill. That's what he says. It's like a magic thing. You just take it and everything goes away. But if you go to a good doctor, he say, listen, you, first of all, you look like hell. You better do something about... The, that's a good doctor. They say the friend is the one that makes you cry, not the one that makes you happy. A good doctor will tell you, what are you doing to yourself? How did you get in? Unfortunately, most of these doctors, they're out there here too. They, he just had his triple bypass. Really, he just had his triple bypass. And the psychiatrist, he's seeing a psychiatrist down the road. And his daughter's uh, taking drugs. Really. We, I mean, we have our own deen. Lakum deenukum wadiya deen. So we, our deen is different, including our medicine. Which doesn't mean we can't, can't learn. I'm not saying throw out all of Western medicine. But what I'm saying is Muslims should not be so naive to think that these people have our good interests in mind. Because the same companies that make those drugs and write the textbooks for these doctors that are studying them are selling drugs that have been outlawed in the United States in Muslim countries. Give it to the brown people. Who cares? They get cancer five years from now. This is a fact. And you have to understand how ruthless these people are because they don't care about you. The only person who care about you is your own self. Save yourselves and save your family. And if we all took that ayah to heart, we wouldn't have any problems in the Muslim world. Anyway, uh, just some thoughts <laughs> to think about. You know, but really, uh, we're, we're in a very desperate condition. The, uh, the secularism has had a massive impact on the Muslims. And we have to get back to our world view. Really, we have to look and analyze the Quran and study it. And look what it considers knowledge, ilm. What it considers knowledge. Knowledge is not science. Science is, a, is this modern science, that's one branch of, of knowledge. And the Muslims are always saying, well, Islam is not against science. Yeah, but there are methodologies of science. There are philosophies of science that we are against. And much of the methodologies and philosophies that are used with their sciences, we are completely opposed to and consider them unethical. They have no problem with torturing animals. They have no problem with that. They torture animals constantly and they say for the betterment of humankind. It's for the betterment of, of the drug company that's funding the... That's the only reason they're torturing animals. They literally, you can see what they torture them. Put electrodes and they don't need to do that stuff. They just want to find out how the central nervous system works and all these things. So, we need to really look and find out what the Quranic worldview is. And the only way we'll be able to do that is literally first to examine our own uh, assumptions because we literally, many of us are looking through colonized eyes we have ideas in our mind that are alien to our culture, to our deen, to our way of life and we have to examine the way we perceive reality and, and reality in, in, in Latin comes from a word which means thing res so their reality is this this is their reality. This is not our reality. The word in Arabic for reality is haqiqa. 
And haqiqah comes from a word which is a name of Allah, al-haq. And this is what we believe reality to be is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is reality. And all this other stuff is just, it's just a contingent existence that Allah has given for a temporal period of time that will disappear and then we will be raised up and recreated and brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way only known to Him and we will be questioned about what we did. We will be questioned. All of us. We will be questioning what we were doing here in London. We will be questioning what we're doing in the United States. What we we're doing. And we have to start really thinking seriously, getting together, using our intellects, setting aside differences to try to work out strategies again for reigniting our deen through the reignition of the hearts of the believers. Of getting back to the, the, the deep teaching of Islam, this radical critical analysis of kufr, of applying it in our lives, altering the way we behave, and literally becoming transformed and transformers. Salihun wa muslihun. Aqulu qawri hadu astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa jazakum wa khair. No single idea is provable, then in order to have a stable society that ensures mutual respect, tolerance and dialogue, you must not let any idea prevail above others. Hence secularism, uh, th that's an aspect of secularism is literally the reduction, what they call values clarification, which is admitting that all ideas and all values can be reduced to a relative perspective of the world based on our socialization and the historical context of, uh, of where we came from, which we reject. We believe in absolute reality. And the Qur'an itself, we believe, is the absolute truth from Allah, although we recognize that there are human, that we are subject to misinterpretations. But we believe also, literally, in the preservation of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of the deen of Allah. It's also preserved from false interpretation. And this is very clear in the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said that I mentioned last night, yamfuna anhu. تحريف الغالين وانتحال المبطلين وتأويل الجاهلين There will always be people in my ummah who preserve this deen from the, the transformations of the excessive people, from the omissions of the, those who want to nullify it, and from the interpretations of the ignorant ones. Uh, may I please ask, how far do you think that Muslims living in the secular society have been in, in, uh, infected in their thinking by these secular ideas? to new movements springing up. That's a good point. There's a lot of movements that, that really they're just, they're just uh, secularized ideas. Their methodologies have been adopted by Marxism. I mean a lot of the Muslim movements literally were influenced by fascism and Marxism. It's completely alien ideas to Islam. And uh, Marxist, Marxism, Marxist, first of all, Marxism uh, critiques. They don't really offer, uh, they never offer a real solution. They just critique. Marxists are very good at critiques. Their solutions are slogans, right? Th that's what they are. So when you hear Muslims saying Islam is the solution, that's called a slogan, right? No, where, if, where is it? Let's see it. What is it? That takes intellectual depth. That takes thinking. You know, anybody can just learn Islam is the solution, but to actually know what Islam does in a given situation and how we bring it about, that takes depth, that takes thought, that takes analysis. We have to transcend the slogan Islam. And we can't do that if we follow methodologies of sloganeers and pamphleteers. How, Muslim, how can Muslims be united? Again, Allah says in the Quran, uh, you consider them all gathered together and their hearts are dispersed. Allah tells us why. Because they're people that don't use their intellect. The way that people become united is literally by using the intellect. And the, the reason that the, the, the Jewish people are, are able to, to come together, even though they have massive differences within their communities, is because they use their rational thought. What is the maslaha? Muslims, we've forgotten the idea of maslaha. What's the benefit of this thing? Everybody just wants to put themselves up and put everybody down. It's like what the Native Americans say, too many chiefs and not enough Indians. You see, that's, a, that's what we've become. To everybody, every opinionated person impressed with his opinions. 
opinions have to be thrown uh, into the light of the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger. And if they're not, then we just throw them like Imam Malik says or Imam Shafi, that we adra bihi ala ard al Just throw it up against the wall, because it's worthless. So th that the way we unite is by literally using our intellect. Because Allah said the reason people are disunited is because they don't use their intellects. And unfortunately we've stopped using, I'm, I'm actually trying to work out the exact historical point when we stopped using our intellect, but it seems at a certain point all the Muslims just went and just turned some key and stopped thinking. And part of not thinking also is being afraid of dialogue. You know, Muslims, we become very closed-minded. We don't like to... Abu Hanifa sat with atheists. He sat with materialists in masjids. And they talked like human beings. Let's see what you have. They weren't afraid. Why? Because they, one, they knew with yaqeen. They had yaqeen. They had hujjaj. They had baraheen. Allah says that these are basair. That, the, that what Allah gives us are proofs. But if you don't know them, any Tom, Dick, or Harry could come along and just uh, get you confused. So Muslims, they get afraid of literally sitting and debating. We'd rather kill each other than debate. It seems easier just to hit somebody over the head than have to think about what they're saying. The, the Prophet ﷺ said two things that I left, which is the Qur'an and the Sunnah. If you take them, you will never go astray. That's, that's the absolute proof. But also the Qur'an and the Sunnah, it's not enough to just memorize it. It says in the Qur'an, We need tazkiyah. Purification of the nafs. We need to literally start purifying our nafs and recognizing the ego and recognizing the nafs when it's playing games with us. Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu said, I never got into an argument with anyone except that I hoped that the truth would manifest on his tongue. Subhanallah. I mean, there's somebody that's worthy to debate, who recognizes that if the truth manifests with this person, then I have to accept it and I'll submit to it. That's somebody who doesn't have an ego. That's somebody whose nafs is under control. Yarkabu nafsahu wa la tarkibuhu. He's riding his nafs and the nafs isn't riding him. That, that's the, those are the imams. So we need tazkiyah, yuzakkihim, wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab, and he teaches them the kitab, wal hikmah, how to apply the book, wisdom. So it's not, we can say the book and the sunnah, but if there's no tazkiyah, you don't have access to the sunnah. Like what Sayyid Najib Abbas, the Malaysian scholar said, that if we don't have adab, we have no access to this uh, knowledge. Allah will not give it to people with bad adab. And the word in Malaysian society for uh, uh, a profligate or somebody that uh, uncultured, uncouth person is be adab, somebody without adab. And the Prophet called the Quran ma'adabat Allah, the place where you learn adab. Uh, although you are not a scholar. Uh, do you know what the ruling is on music, singing, playing, and listening? Uh, that's a thick question, and just refer to the fuqaha on that one. Well, I mean, everybody, why do we keep asking these questions over and over again? I, I've heard this question seriously. I mean, and, and alhamdulillah, I mean, I've studied it, and I'm, but I'm not going to waste my time answering the question. Seriously. We just ask these questions. Is riba halal? Can we buy a house on riba? Uh, can we do this? Can we do that? I mean, seriously, well, I, we have to stop reinventing the wheel. What are the modern problems which need ishtihad, but are there qualified Muslims to make intellectual exercise? There's a lot now. We're, we're in an age with massive, we've got, these, these people are cloning animals. They're literally, they've got, uh, sh uh, they've got uh, cats that they put DNA of leopards, so they get leopard spots. They're crossing, I mean, they're unbelievable stuff they're doing. Mad people, completely insane. It's Frankenstein. It's mad scientists. Like this, I told this at a conference about talking about science, and this man got up and said, I'm a nuclear physicist, and I take offense to physics is good, and this and that. I said, what's good about it? You told me what good, you, you gave us the atom bomb? You know, I mean seriously, you gave us the atom bomb, this wonderful, remarkable improvement on, on the quality of life for the Hiroshima, people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I'm sure they're very grateful 
for your great contribution to the 20th century. And, and what right do people have to go around smashing atoms? Who gave them the right to go around and smash atoms? Seriously. I mean, they don't even know what they're doing. They go and just smash an atom with their nuclear accelerators just to watch what happens. There's absolutely no, they just want to watch what happens. It's a type of madness. And they're, they're deeply, uh, if you meet a lot of these people, and I have, I've met them, uh, and not all of them, and there's good in physics, engineering, and things like that. Handasa is a fard kifaya. So learning physics, I'm not saying don't learn physics, but recognize that we have a different methodology and a philosophy of science. And you meet a lot of these people, and they, they, they can't even sit and talk with human beings. They'd rather talk to a computer. They're, they're, I know people who work in Silicon Valley, engineers, and they tell me that they, they've got all these engineers on these computers, and, and when you come in to tell them something, they say, send it on my email. They don't want to interact with a human being. They'd rather interact with a computer. You see, so everybody's going to end up having sex with computers and everything. That's what they're doing now. It's not a joke. They've got uh, downloading all this pornography and things. I don't know. But unfortunately, people aren't learning how to ishtihad uh, and things like that. Do you think Saudi Arabia applies complete sharia? Subhanallah. <laughs> do, you, do you see the Muslim preacher in the Muslim country who is thinking he is dealing with non-Muslims, emphasizing all the time aqidah, but fail to interpret Islam in this modern world? Uh, emphasis on aqidah. First of all, aqidah is dogma. I want to remind us, aqidah is not iman. Aqidah is dogma. The Muslims never emphasized Aqidah. What they emphasized was Iman. Aqidah is very simple. You can learn it in a few days with a, a, a good scholar. Sit down. There's Mutun. You learn them. I have a metan that I learned in the deserts of Mauritania. It's literally 20 lines of poetry. And the whole of the dogma is there. And you can learn that. That's a, emphasis on Aqidah is a sickness. It's a disease of the Muslim. We need to emphasize Iman. Tarbiyat al-Iman. Tazkiyat al-Nufus. Of, of all we sit around talking about where is Allah you don't even know where you are subhanallah uh, you talked about the secular how these <laughs> turn people upside down what attracted you to become a Muslim uh, Alhamdulillah, Hidayah, I became Muslim when I was 17, I was very fortunate, I had a, a serious car accident, made me think about uh, death and some, some other things, and Alhamdulillah, Allah uh, showed me Islam with, at the hands of some people that I thought had a good understanding, and I became Muslim, and then I decided to go study uh, Islam, because I wanted to, uh, to find out for myself, I and mean, part of the confusion of the aid is people don't learn, they don't study anymore. You know, and the Rihla was part of the Islamic legacy of literally leaving your home and going and finding out what Islam is from people. And I went and, uh, and you know, alhamdulillah, there's uh, Muhammad Makkah who I haven't seen in years. When, when we first met, I didn't know Arabic. I didn't know, is that true? When you first met me? And alhamdulillah, I, he knows some of the sheikhs I studied with. I went and, and studied with people that, 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 that they have a good understanding of Islam. And that's what I wanted to get from them. You know, and, and that, that for me solved my, my confusions, uh, you know, really. I mean, there's a lot of things that are bewildering, but alhamdulillah, the Islam to me is very clear. I mean, the Qur'an is mubeen. It, with mubeen also means clear, clarifying. You know, it, it's clear and it's clarifying. You know, it makes things clear. So if you're confused, it's because you haven't really uh, studied the deen. And you get it from the people who know it. Don't get it from people who don't know it or who are as confused as you are or who memorized a few slogans. Was it not a Razi who claimed that the, he only drank wine for medicine? Uh, there's many Razis, the Fakhruddin al Razi that I quoted, definitely not. Uh, uh, Ar Razi or Ar Farabi, great followers of Aristotelian thought. There are, Razi is from a uh, city in Persia called Rait, and there are many scholars named Razi, and there was a Razi who was an Aristotelian, but that is not Fakhruddin al Razi who I was mentioning. Uh, how should we pay for goods cash only? The best thing is to use cash, and even this cash, be aware that it's also bank notes that are interest bearing bonds. 
And the only reason they can print that paper is because they've been given, given permission by the banks. And they're based on selling bonds and these type of things. So the, even the cash is usury. I mean, it's, it's all, the, we're all covered in the dust of it, folks. What is your opinion on the end of the Roman Empire in relation to the rise of the church and the eventual rise of materialism? Well, the, the rise of the church and the Roman Empire is very interesting because I think that we're in the same type of situation and it's literally, they are in the same serious decline of the Roman Empire and Islam is, it should play the role that Christianity played in the first revivification of the European society. Because Christianity, despite what we say about it, it there are positive effects of it on, on, on these societies. I mean, even they recognized that the atrocities that they did were committed against religion, not, you know, even though it was in the name of religion. Now, the Muslims never did these things because our book teaches us literally to tolerate other religions, and they don't have that, right? So, but, uh, you know, there were positive effects. I mean, they did, they did worship God in their own way. And, uh, and now's the time for Islam because Christianity is an unscientific religion. It really uh, is, is not in harmony with the age at all. Uh, Islam, according to Octavio Paz, who is a Nobel Prize winner from Mexico, he said that we are literally on the brink of destruction. The only thing that will save us is a reunification of religion and science. And he said, and the only religion in the history of human society that has succeeded in doing that is Islam. That's what he said. That's their Nobel Prize winner. And, uh, and that's, but if we're not there to let them know what it is, you know, What is your comment on some Islamic organizations going through Kufr parliamentary system? As I understand that to go through this system is haram. Could you please enlighten me on this? I, I don't really know about it. Like uh, they might be referring to this thing called the Parliament of Islam or, or Muslims. I don't know. I've just heard it. I have nothing about it. The actual systems in Islam, uh, government systems, it's, it's rather open based. Um, there, there is a type of legislation that takes place in Islam based on maslaha. It's what Imam Malik radiallahu in his usul called maslah al mursala, like traffic laws. That's part of Sharia, traffic laws, literally based on this idea of maslah al mursala, and uh, and to disobey traffic laws is actually considered by the the ulama as a type of wrong action because the maslaha, the reason for the traffic laws is to maintain safety of the people driving. So if you abuse those laws, you endanger yourself and others, which is haram. So this is the type of qiyas that's used. And there's Muslim, they don't, you know, they just run red lights and don't, uh, you know, don't care. And takbir, Allahu Akbar, kufr laws, right? <laughs> What is your comment on corrupt leaders of the so-called Muslim countries? Are they kafirs or what? Or what? Yeah, that's, I don't know. That's subhanAllah. As, as you, there is no Islam party in British Parliament or politics, therefore is it halal to vote in party, which I, I don't... Uh, just refer to your fuqaha on those things, you know. Today we are in a very bad condition. Please, can you expound the reasons for the... Maybe they just got here. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to do my best. كثير من الأخوة المسلمون يجعلون كلمة العلمانية كلمة شيطانية تعلموا بالعلوم الكونية والأطباء والمهندسين عندهم فهم بالتعريف أها Okay, this person is saying like a lot of Muslims use the word ilmaniya, which is the, a very poor translation of secularism. A better translation would be dunyawiya, literally, because secularism in Latin means the world. And ilmaniya comes from knowledge, and that's not uh, a good translation, unfortunately. This is part of the corruption of the Muslim uh, mind. I wouldn't be surprised if this was done by a non-Muslim, whoever originally put this word in many because it was somebody or a committee. I, it was probably by some Lebanese Christians, I would think. Um, they say it's a, a satanic word. There are dunyawi sciences that we accept. There are also secular aspects to light. There, there's there's uh, aspects that the Prophet said in Sahih Muslim when they were doing the date palms, uh, the ta'vir of the date palms, and, and he thought it was strange 
because it, it seems strange. I think it's strange. It's amazing, you know, that you have to fecundate to get a better harvest. Um, and he mentioned that, and then they left it, and they had a bad crop. When they came to him, he said, you know, don't antum adra bi umuri dunyakum. You know better about your dunya affairs. You see, so there's aspects that don't, you know, that, that Islam allows for the dunya. But if you have imbibed an Islamic worldview, you will not transgress those. You see what I mean? And that's the important thing, is that concerning our dunya affairs, we are still constrained by the injunctions and the moral and ethical principles of Islam. But there are aspects to life that are temporal, that, that do not involve the... So, I mean, Hendasa, like learning uh, engineering and these types of things, they're useful, they're important sciences. There's no doubt about that. It's not the only thing in the world, which they have a hard time convincing some people, Muslims of that. But, but uh, they're, they're useful sciences, and I'm not condemning sciences. I mean, what I'm saying is that the philosophy of science is what we need to examine and investigate. You know, because we have a different philosophy of science. Their philosophy is based on control, subjugation, on exploitation, on commodification. Our sciences were based on enhancement, on, on nourishing human societies. I mean, most of the Islamic inventions dealt with the enhancement of life. Most of these inventions are just gadgets to get people to consume so somebody can make some money. And most of them, the vast majority of them, are completely useless. I mean, the hadith about the Dajjal having a fire that when you go into it, it's paradise, and having a, a paradise when you go into it, it's a fire. I mean, to me, there's a, there's a real, I'm not saying this is what the hadith means, but it's, there's an interesting analogy of, of what they promise, you know, the, the consumer society and technological society. They present it like it's a paradise. It's going to save all our, uh, solve all our problems. And, but when people actually get into it, I mean, I know there's people that, came here from from Pakistan from a village in Pakistan and and really they, they were in paradise there and now they they're living here like they're in hell you see but but these people think that's hell if you ask them like living in a village in the middle of a a backward quote unquote backward country they say oh that's hell there's no washing machines where they go to the bathroom right and those people happy they don't have heart disease they smile all the time they pray five times a day in the masjid they you know they have healthy children I lived in the Saharan desert with people like that and they were actually happy people it's amazing to meet happy people nowadays you kind of wonder, what, what, here, they, what are you smiling about? You know, it's like, like something's wrong with you or something. Uh, sh surely the solution of jihad, okay, you have talked about the problem of secularism, surely the solution is jihad. Could you please talk about how you go about doing jihad? Well, jihad has many meanings in Islam. There is a jihad which is jihad of safe, no doubt. And... Uh, you know, I'd read by analogy um, jihad of, of uh, arms and things like that. Part of what we should recognize is that Western societies literally sell us weapons. You see, they're not afraid of us. They'll give us all the machine guns we want. If you have enough money, you can buy all the machine guns you want. As long as they have the atom bomb, they're not worried about your machine guns. So people say, well, then we should get the atom bomb, right? Uh, well, what, then what's that going to solve? They used to call the arms race between Russia and America MAD, MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. If they blow us up, we're going to make sure they all get blown up as well. So once the, all the missiles, the inner ballistic, intercontinental missiles, if they, once they saw they were coming from Russia, then we'd push the button and we'd send all theirs there. Probably a lot of sol solutions to our problems would have been solved had they ever done that. But... Uh, but, I mean, in the end, that's what it is, mad. It's just a mutually assured destruction. I, per personally, the Prophet forbade killing with fire. Nuclear atomic warhead is, are killing people with fire. It is incinerating them. And Allah said, the Prophet said, لا يعذب بالنار إلا رب النار. No one can punish with fire except the Lord of fire. And that's what these bombs, in Iraq, they used fire bombs. A lot of the bombs, they literally roasted Iraqi soldiers alive. These great humanistic, uh, wonderful people. Have a nice day. That's what they say in America. Have a nice. They say the drought in California because people have been saying have a nice day for 20 years. Many, uh, anyway. So jihad. There's a hadith, Musnad Ahmed. Ida ida tabayatum bil'ina. 
واتبعتم اذناب البقر وتركتم الجهاد في سبيل الله لا يسلطن عليكم الله عدوا من غير انفسكم ولا يرفع عنكم البلاء او في روايه الذل حتى تراجعوا دينكم if you begin to buy and sell with credit and usury and you start following the baqar the tales of of baqar interesting cows beef um, and and that means following dunya because agriculture to the arabs was a zara'a was a type you know it was kind of synonymous with worldly dunya and he said and you leave jihad fi sabili Allah, allah will uh, subjugate you to an enemy from outside of yourself and you will not be raised that that tribulation will not be taken from you until you return to your deen which means also returning to jihad but we we have to recognize where we are who we are what our own limitations are you know it's what 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 they call in corporate management uh, sphere of concern and sphere of influence you see muslims always talk about jihad 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 what's the reality of that you see what i mean we need to stop talking about things and literally start doing things we can talk all day long so we have to recognize what is our sphere of influence our sphere of concern is the entire world but what's the sphere of influence where can we actually impact what can we do and this is what we need to be concerned about i mean muslims talk about the rulers all the time as an individual i am not going to change the 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 regime in such and such a place as collective group of people if we rectify ourselves we are promised by allah that he will rectify us in fact in the quran it says ya ayyuhal ladina amanu taqullaha wa qulu qawlan sadida have taqwa and just speak upright be upright how many muslims that you know are upright in their speech how many muslims do you know that are upright in their speech قُلُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا Then what does Allah say? يُصْلِحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبُكُمْ Allah will rectify your conditions. If you do that, this is like a, a condition. If you do this, Allah will do this. It's a, it's a shart. And in the Arabic grammar, المشروط محصور في الشرط that, that the thing is contained in the other thing. So if we have taqwa of Allah, and if we're upright in the way we speak, which includes calling to dawah because Allah says in the Quran that the most upright is is the one who speaks the truth and calls to the deen of Islam so being upright in the speech wa man ahsanu qawlan mimma da'a ila Allah that's the best way to be upright is to call to Allah wa amila saliha and to do righteous actions so Allah says attaqu Allah wa qulu qawlan sadida yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum not only will he take care of our dunya but he will take care of our akhirah as well by forgiving us our wrong actions it's very clear quran is mubin you need to base on your friends what can Muslims do to establish Islam in British society starting in their own community? Uh, personally, I think one of the most important things right now is the establishment of uh, areas where Muslims live. Muslims should live together. I mean, the Chinese, you see, you have Chinatowns all over the world. Chinese aren't stupid. They're very clever people. They literally stay in there. They maintain their language. We've lost our language. I met an Arab last night, told me he grew up here, he doesn't speak Arabic. Subhanallah. I mean Allah asked do you exchange the high for the low you'd rather speak the queen's english than than the king's arabic <laughs> subhanallah and that's another thing that I didn't talk about language and the effect the impact that arabic has on the mind and also on the world view of learning arabic uh language deeply muslims all of us should be committed to arabic imam shafi in his risala said yajibu ala kulli muslimin ta'allam al arabiya ma yablughu juhduhu that every muslim has to learn arabic according to his capacity and even though the later muslims put it as a fard kifaya a kifaya is only good if there's enough people that know it and we don't have enough people that know arabic anymore guarantee you so a, a fard kifaya becomes an ain until the kifaya is reestablished so really learning arabic is incumbent on on the entire ummah and we should learn it anyway people learn english for dunya they can't learn akhira akhira language really people some people muslim we have muslim here they speak english much better than english people 
And they learned it for dunya. Uh, you mentioned death of Jesus. Do you th believe Jesus is coming back or is he dead? The dominant position of the people of Sunnah and Jama'ah and in the Aqidah of Imam al tahawi is that Isa alayhi salam returns at the end of time and uh, that's the dominant position of the Muslims and inshallah that's the one I, I adhere to and I hope I die on that inshallah. Our zoos halal. <laughs> He's asking that because we're living in one. London, man, this is, a, this is the biggest zoo. It's the biggest zoo in the world. I was on Edgware Road last night. That's a zoo from the Middle East. They brought exotic animals over here. <laughs> Subhanallah. You, that, Imam al Khimari said in the Quran, we that wahushu husharat. He said that that was one, the, one of the signs of the end of time, that that actual ayah applies to the before the akhirah, that the wild animals would all be contained uh, in the end of time. And uh, Allah Ta'ala A'lam, I'm not making that tafsir, that's the tafsir of Imam Al-Ghimari, uh, who was a Azhari Shaykh and a Muhaddith. Um, is it only domestic animals that we are allowed to keep? Um, Zoo is a very strange, I mean this is part of the whole, the, the, the kuffar have made the whole world their zoo. They literally, Morocco is a zoo for them. They go down and they ogle the animals. That's what they do. They take pictures of them. And subhanAllah, how can you go and take, if you did that in London to an English person, just take his picture like that, he'd come up and, and grab the camera and, well, what are you doing? What do you think I am, just some kind of freak show? But the Muslim and the Arab countries and the, and the non-Arab countries, people go and with their pictures and take pictures of them like they're some kind of animal. They even take pictures of their women, which is haram. You know, I mean, people, that's a loss of izzah. We don't have dignity anymore. Why? Because Allah says, uh, Allah says, What izzah to lillahi? Izzah is for Allah. Wa li rasulihi. And for his message, wa lil mu'mineen. And to the people of iman. You're over them if you're a mu'min. That's a shart. In kuntum mu'minin. All the ayahs in which Allah says that we will be given victory, that we are over them, that they're all conditional sentences in the Quran. They're all conditions based on actions. In If you give victory for Allah, Allah will give victory for you, but don't expect victory from Allah if you're not doing anything for Allah. We don't believe in unconditional love. That's just something some psychiatrists made up to make some money. What do we do? Because even Allah says, "In kuntum tahibun Allah, fatbi'uni yuhibkum Allah." Allah's love is conditional. It's based on following the messenger of Allah. It's not like this Christian. It's all love and harmony, and God's going to forgive us all. They don't even believe that. Because read the, their revelations at the end of time when they say Jesus comes back and everybody condemned to hell except these 144,000 people, which the Jehovah's Witness. There are only 144,000 people going to heaven. So who wants to join that religion? <laughs> and it's one of the fastest growing religions in the world. I mean, all they have to do is just some basic mathematics, but they don't encourage you to go to school. The Jehovah's Witness, they don't want you to go to school because you learn mathematics, realize 144,000, there's 5 million Jehovah's Witnesses. Man, most of us are going to hell. <laughs> uh, if the Kafirs fight us with atom bombs, then how do we counterattack them uh, without nuclear bombs? There's a cartoon I once saw. Uh, that showed these Africans with spears and the British came down with their guns and they were shooting them, the Africans were throwing the spears and then the next picture it showed the Africans uh, with guns and the British with machine guns and they were just mowing them all down and then the next picture showed the Africans with machine guns and the British uh, with airplanes dropping bombs <laughs> and then the final picture showed the Africans all with the tanks going by and the airplanes and they're all saluting that they're one-handed takbir right? I mean people now are silent for the national anthem and they speak while the Adhan's going on really people are silent for the national anthem and when the Adhan's going on they talk they even talk when the Quran's going on I was at a, a conference and and we I was trying to buy a book in a in a souk in the conference and, and the guy's got Quran blasting next to me. I went over, I said, Yeah, he, could you please turn this off? 
Because I'm trying to do a dunya transaction and this is Quran. And he said, why? Because he's selling it. I said, because Allah says, إِذَا قُرِيَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذَا قُرِيَ الْقُرَانِ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِتُوا If you listen to the Qur'an, if, you, if the Qur'an is recited, listen to it and be silent. And he said, is that wajib? He said, subhanAllah. <laughs> and we want to know why we are in the condition we're in. You see? But if he's watching television, you know what he says to his wife? Shut up! I'm trying to watch this! You see? Seriously. These same characters. Be quiet, I'm trying, well, you, you disturbing me? Mike Tyson, I'm trying, well, it's only 85 seconds, and I paid 25 quid for this. <laughs> they say, takbir, now Muslim, that one they do, they takbir, Mike Tyson won, subhanAllah. That's Zul and Hawan. So anyway, the last picture in the frame showed them all with the airplane, and then it showed this one kafir in a big computerized room with these warheads all <laughs> facing Africa. So that's where we're at. They gave us all their dead weapons, and we end up killing each other with them anyway. If, if the Muslims were in the state of mind they're in now, and they had the nuclear bomb, they wouldn't drop it on Tel Aviv, they'd drop it on Riyadh, or drop it on Baghdad. Seriously. With the, if these characters had that, I hope Saddam Hussein never gets the atom bomb. Because he'd just drop it on the Muslims before he'd drop it on the, the Kuffar. Seriously, we should use our brains. Alhamdulillah, Jazakum Allah Khairan, and my intention, these are, uh, you know, the purpose is just, inshallah, just to get us all thinking a little bit, and uh, my intention is not to offend anybody, if I mention any nationalities, any uh, thing, that is not my intention, I don't, and even some of the questions, if I'm a little harsh on, on my response, it just, you know, it's just, uh, it's not so much the question, but it's, you know, it's being, having done this for several years now, and this being the thousandth time I've had that question, you know, and, and I'm just wondering, I mean, it might genuinely be the first time you've ever asked a question, or you might be a new Muslim or something, so my intention wasn't to make fun of asking the question, but just, you know, it's just frustrating for me as an individual, so I apologize for that. I did not, whoever wrote that question, I apologize to you for my reaction. It was not from you as an individual, but from a collective state. Alright. Imam Malik said, Man qada, man qada, uh, said, Man qada nas The one who says that people are finished or destroyed, he's the most destroyed of them. Imam Malik said that that means if he says it out of arrogance, thinking that he's better than them. In other words, if he says it tahazzunan, out of grief and, and just of our own human condition, then, then it doesn't, that, that wa'id from the Prophet doesn't apply. So uh, all of us, you know, we're in a destitute state and we, we need to ask Allah, we need to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a sincere tawbah. Tawbu ila Allahi tawbat al nasuha. Turn to Allah in a pure tawbah, collectively, as an ummah. And this is really, as far as I can see, we have to turn to Allah because Allah, la malja minhu illa ilayh. There is no safety from Him except to Him. There's no safety from him except to him. That's Tawheed. You want Aqidah, there's your Aqidah. There's no safety from him except to him. Because at Amru Biyadillah, the affair is in the hands of Allah, it's not in America. I told a Muslim, I was so grieved, really. I was, I was almost in tears when I saw McDonald's in Mecca. I mean, I really, it just, it just broke my heart to see McDonald's in Mecca. And I'm in this sacred place that you can't even uproot a tree. <laughs> you know, and these uh, kuffar are just running around with impunity. And the person I told this to, he, he, he felt like weeping. And he said, we just have to remember, Hamza, that Allah is, Allah is over them. Allah is over these people. Allah is over them. And Allah will take them to account. But, but we need to raise this ummah up. And if we, if we don't do it, If you don't do it, Allah will replace you with people who do it. And the ayah might take two, three, four, five, ten generations, but it's going to happen. So, I don't know. Jazakumullah khairan wa salam alaykum.